Uh, Alyssa, shooting this. Alyssa, tell everybody your last name and say hello to your mom and grandmother. Go ahead. Uh, Alyssa Willis. Hi, Mom. All right, and your grandmother. And hi, Mimi. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about how Steel won World War II. And we're going to talk about how this man, Carl Zachariah, an attorney along with Christine Brown Murphy, calling Rakovich, Ben Urso, Justin Ellis. You hear them all the time on News Radio 1020 Kitty Gay with their wonderful program, Zachariah Brown. Achieva will be joining them this Tuesday. Eddie Crow filling in at 7 o'clock. If you're a retired steel worker, obviously, or you're a part of that, well, AARP crowd, what they can do for you as far as elder law, Pittsburgh elder law. But he grew up in where? The Keysport? The Keysport. All right, talk about the steel industry back in the heyday, 60s, you growing up. When we were growing up, if you're going downtown, you weren't going to Pittsburgh. You were going to McKeesport, downtown McKeesport, where there was restaurants, four or five department stores, 30 or 40 other stores, uh, restaurants, shows. That was half the place. It was. And listen, I want you to understand, folks, from 1875 to 1920, American steel production grew from 380,000 tons to 60 million tons annually. And a lot of that had to do with the availability of iron, ore, and coal, and of course, manpower. 1869 was already a major industry accounting for 6.6% of the manufacturing employment. In the 1880s it grew, but then it was that man, Andrew Carnegie, who came from Scotland and changed and really revolutionized the steel industry with Carnegie Steel that would eventually become U.S. Steel. Some names, Henry Clay Frick from the coal industry, J.P. Morgan, who eventually would go on to found General Electric, another big part of that as well. And you think of Homestead and everything that they did there, World War I, but you move forward when U.S. Steel, of course, the consolidation after Mr. Carnegie retired and sold the company, what it meant to us winning World War II and the coal mines in West Virginia and all of the other great uh, steel companies that we all remember, Bethlehem Steel, Republic Steel. And these are the people along with the unions and the legacy that gave us a chance to defeat Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan. Dave, you of course uh, spent the majority of your life in the steel industry. Talk about the significance of what steel did to win World War II. Well, Rob, uh, as you know, uh, coming through the valley, there were so many uh, steel facilities in uh, Beaver Valley that uh, are no longer here. You know, you start from the north end of the, of the county uh, with uh, companies like BMW, and that called and Wilcox and their products all for steel, Townsend Company, Superior Con. Wyckoff, National Electric, Armco, Macintosh, Hemphill, JNL, LTP, ATI, Midland, Crucible, Steel, and Midland, and many, many others. They're, you know, they, they're, not, they're no longer there, but they play such an important role uh, in World War II, in, in the victory of in, in World War II. Westinghouse, uh, at the time, uh, made parts for their uh, military air, BMW, of course, with two million products in high demand uh, from the government, and, and tool steel producers like Crucible, Vulcan, Canadian alloys, all, all uh, Beaver Valley plant produced steel for gun barrels and uh, military, other military items such as uh, all the aircraft, ships, and tanks. Uh, those automotive plants in Detroit uh, were converted from uh, automobile production to the uh, production of tanks and heavy artillery units. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, Detroit made a, made a major part, but so did Beaver County with the, with the, uh, the uh, uh, mills that I just mentioned that uh, produced so heavily in, uh, in the uh, 40s and 50s, even during the Korean conflict, and are no longer there. All right, listen, I want to talk to Carl Zachariah. You know, when we were growing up, most of our dads, my dad, 41 years, basically put his time in, got the gold watch, got the pension, they had enough to live on, the company paid the freight, and they had health care that was pretty much 100%. Things have changed and people have had to kind of uh, reinvent themselves. Someone retires with a 401k, but they have the money, but they don't know where to put that money and how it can benefit them as far as that transition into their senior life, which truly are supposed to be your golden years. What can you do for them and what's your advice from the elder law attorneys that you need to be in touch with, of course, Zachariah Brown, Carl. Well, a lot of that will depend on their stage of life. Where is that person at? What's their family situation? What is their uh, their financial situation? And, you know, if they're going to invest their money, it's got to be something secure, something that's not going to grow rapidly nor decline rapidly. So just something in a nice, safe, safe steady, fixed income investment will probably work well for most. Last thing, what would you tell them as far as if one spouse dies? Obviously, we talked last time about wills and power of attorney. You have all that in place. 
you're dealing with gifting, the five-year look back, all of the stuff that can be found, information about on their website at PittsburghElderLaw.com, E-L-D-E-R Law.com. And now someone is left to make the decision of, I'm moving out of my house, how do I maybe pass it on to my children, how do I have enough to take care of all of those bills that really you concur when you are a senior, and in particular, if you have to go into assisted living, and if that time arrives, make it as seamless as possible. Well, you know, a big one that we deal with every single day is that house. Dealing with a family home, they transfer it to their kids' name, and that is not the best thing to do. I had two cases this week where um, the, the parents had transferred the, the house to the kids for a dollar, parent passed away, and now the kids sold the house, and they did not realize that they had a capital gains tax to pay on it. That's a big deal. 20% capital gains tax on that. They never expected it. There's ways of dealing with it. There's ways of selling your house, protect your, excuse me, there's ways of protecting your house without selling it to your kids or giving it to your kids. You can't have your cake and eat it too, and that's what we have people to do. All right, for Dave Pasquale, Attorney Carl Zacharias, Sam McKinney, don't forget, Memorial Day Parade coming up Monday. They're open for breakfast. No one will treat you better. And a salute to all of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and have served this country. Good night from the Brighton Hot Dog Shop. We'll check back with you later tonight from the Pratt Pack Gym. Hopefully to talk about a Penguins victory with Ty Ballou. And don't forget, coming up this weekend in this town, they've got their huge triathlon event, which has become a tradition in these parts. So if you can, feel free to uh, pedal, swim, and run and participate. Good night.